Amen. Well, good morning. My name is Andy Nacelli, and as Taylor introduced me, I teach systematic theology and New Testament at Bethlehem College and Seminary in Minneapolis. Anybody heard of that school? A few of you? Okay, so John Piper's our chancellor. He's the only famous guy there, and then there's a bunch of other people. Uh, I just found out there are a couple connections here. So we just prayed together for Dan Weller, a pastor in the area. That's one of my MDiv guys. It's one of our students. And then uh, Pastor Bob came up and said that this is John Tsupika's old church. I taught him as well, and he was in my small group. So there are several connections. Another connection is that I'm very close friends, dear friends, with Drew Hunter's brother, Trent, who's a pastor in South Carolina. Has he preached here before? All right, so great guy. So there we go, three connections. We're friends. <laughs> All right. So the, the nature of this sermon is very different than you may be used to. I'm guessing that your diet here is, at this point, they, uh, the pastor would say, open your Bible to, you turn to a, a spot, and then the pastor explains that passage and applies it. That, that's called an expositional sermon. You're just expositing, you're exposing what the text says. Well, I'm going to do something unusual. I'm going to still try to use that method, but I'm going to do it for a topic with the whole Bible as what I'm trying to exposit. So it's, it's actually harder to do it this way. And the topic is justice. So I'm going to attempt to preach and teach what the whole Bible says about justice. But before I show you how we're going to proceed, I'd like to introduce it this way. So here are three questions that have become controversial in our culture in recent years. Question one, what is marriage? Question two, what is a woman? And question three, what is justice? So the Merriam-Webster Dictionary recently, a few years ago, added a definition for female, for example, in their dictionary, and it really was to appease transgender activists. Here's the new definition for female. Having a gender identity that is the opposite of male. That's a real definition. It's ridiculous. Uh, so it reminds me of what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 10. Though we walk in the flesh... We're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. What are those strongholds? We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. So our spiritual warfare as Christians include destroying arguments that rebel against the Creator's design. That's why there's a battle for the dictionary, for a word like woman. The world regularly takes words from the Bible and redefines them, it takes a good word, a word that, that, that represents something that God created, that God designed, and then it twists it. So God created and designed men and women and marriage. So we want to understand what those words actually mean. We want to define the words man and woman and marriage in a way that accords with reality. And the same is true for the word justice. Justice is a good word. The world has taken that Bible word and twisted it, redefined it by attaching certain adjectives in front of it, words that describe it. I'll give you five examples. One is LGBT justice. According to this view, everyone must affirm and celebrate the ideology of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people, and any sexual orientations or gender identities that don't correspond to heterosexual norms. Is that justice? I think that justice, in this case, would look more like Genesis 19.24. The Lord reigned on Sodom and Gomorrah, sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. That would be justice. Here's a second example. Reproductive justice. What's that? Pregnant people. That's a new term because not just women, but men can get pregnant too. So we call them pregnant people. Pregnant people have a human right to have personal bodily autonomy, to choose to keep or to kill the unborn baby in one's womb. 
reproductive justice. Is that justice? I think justice would look more like what God commanded the Israelites in Leviticus 22. Anyone who gives any of his children to Molech shall surely be put to death. That's justice. Here's a third example. Distributive justice. Society must distribute or allocate power and resources so that there are equal outcomes. Is that justice? I think that justice is that God-ordained authorities impartially punish law-breaking and right wrongs, but not that everyone has equal outcomes. More on that one later. A fourth example is racial justice. Society, according to this view, must remove systemic racial disparities in areas such as wealth, income, education, and employment. Justice is equal outcomes, and a failure to have equal outcomes is racism. Is that justice according to Scripture? I think that justice is that society treats all ethnicities impartially. And we'll we'll come back to, to that one. And fifth, this one's a little more complicated, social justice. So in order to understand this term, at least how people use it today, Uh, you have to understand what critical theory is. So in a nutshell, critical theory affirms four beliefs, and I'm paraphrasing a guy named Neil Shenby right now. So number one, society is divided into two groups, oppressors and oppressed. So the oppressors have power, they're evil bullies, the oppressed do not have power, they are innocent victims, just by virtue of being oppressed. Number two, Oppressors, that's the dominant group, maintain their power by imposing their ideology on everyone. Number three, lived experience gives oppressed people special access to truths about their oppression. And then number four, this is what I'm driving toward, society needs social justice. That is, society needs to pursue equal outcomes by deconstructing and eliminating all forms of social oppression. What's social oppression? That includes not just disparities regarding race and ethnicity, but also gender, sexual orientation, religion, physical ability, mental ability, and economic class. The term wokeness, have you heard that word, woke, wokeness? That refers to the state of being consciously aware of, of being awake to this social injustice. Is that version of justice, social justice, is that biblical justice? I think that justice is that God-ordained authorities oppose partiality in civic life by impartially punishing unjust perpetrators and righting wrongs. Again, more on that later. So that was just five examples of how the world has taken a good word and twisted its meaning by adding adjectives on the front of it. In order to evaluate those definitions, we need to answer a more fundamental question. What does God mean when he uses the word justice in the Bible? That's that's the question to ask. That's the standard. That's the reality we want to understand and live in light of. So it's crucial that we define justice correctly. That's going to be our goal in this sermon, is to show how justice is a glorious Bible word that we don't want to surrender. So we're going to consider justice in five steps. First is divine justice, God's character. Second will be imputed justice, the glorious doctrine of justification. Third, imparted justice, progressive sanctification. Fourth, and that's what we're driving towards to show how this controversial issue relates to the Bible's teaching on justice, I'm calling public justice impartiality in society. And then the capstone in the Scripture storyline is ultimate justice, final judgment. So that's the, the, the skeleton, the backbone of the sermon this morning. I'll be showing that, uh, that five-point outline as we go, so you don't have to get it all right now. Each of those five steps could be an entire book. I've actually written a few books on number two and three, imparted justice and how that relates to imputed justice. Uh, But I'm going to be concise here so that we can see the big picture of how these five aspects 
of justice correspond and integrate. And number four, I'm addressing the controversial issue of public justice by situating it in relation to these other aspects of justice according to the Bible. So let's start with this first one. Let's go to the source, divine justice, God's character. Divine justice, God's character. Justice is a word God has given us to describe a reality that is true of God himself. God describes himself this way. I don't normally use Greek and Hebrew words in a sermon. I'm not trying to, you know, say I know something you don't. But in this case, I'm going to mention just a few of them because I think it's helpful to hear what's behind some of these words in your Bible translations for justice and just. So I'm going to read some, some of these passages, and I'll mention the word underlying it. So Genesis 18 says, Shall not the judge, it's from a verb mishpat, shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And that's the word mishpat. So you've got a verb and a noun related. Judge what is just. Deuteronomy 32, the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. That's that same word. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just, that's a different word, tzadik, just and upright is he. He, the Lord, has established his throne for justice. That's mishpat again. This has never happened to me. Whew, it's like I have to go the rest by memory. Okay. This is good. This is better for all of us this way. Another one. This is Psalm 11. The Lord is righteous. That's tzadik. He loves righteous deeds. Similar word, tzedakah. So those are related. The Lord of hosts, according to Isaiah 5, is exalted in justice, mishpat. And the holy God shows himself holy in righteousness, tzedakah. I'm the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness. Those are those two words again. The Lord within her is righteousness, tzaddik. He does no injustice. Every morning he shows forth his justice. There's mishpat again. Righteousness and justice. Those are those two words are the foundation of his throne. So there's a pair of words that occurs over and over and over, are often translated justice and righteousness. And it's that pair of words I like, want to hone in on here. The, there's a Greek translation of the Old Testament that typically translates those two words with words in Greek that are typically translated righteousness and judgment. But sometimes, uh, uh, I'd say usually the, the Septuagint translates that word uh, righteousness, tzedek, as the normal word for righteousness in the New Testament, dikaiosune, and the adjective similarly. But this is so interesting. It translates the word mishpat as dikaiosune sometimes as well. I mean, all the, the point I'm trying to make is there's, we have these two Hebrew words that have an overlap in their meaning. And when we come to our English translations, sometimes it's hard to distinguish justice and righteousness. They're also related terms. So this can, this can be confusing when you're reading your English translation. Uh, in English, justice, a slide for this, justice is the legal quality of getting what you deserve, and righteousness is the moral quality of being right. At least that's, I'm an English speaker. Sound right to you, you English speakers? Is that typically the distinction between those words? So sometimes they can be the same, synonymous, but if they're distinct, that's the normal way they're distinct. And the, there's this Hebrew word and Greek word that don't, the, the thing is, they don't sharply distinguish those concepts the way we do in English. That's, that's what I'm trying to highlight. It, the, the Hebrew and Greek words can include both of those concepts on the, on the screen, the legal quality and the moral quality. The point is those words are about right order in this fallen world. And when you turn to the Greek New Testament, the concepts of both justice and righteousness are present in uh, words that are usually translated justice or righteousness, just or righteous, uh, and a verb declare righteous, which, which one linguist defines as to set right, to do justice, to deem or prove right, justify, acquit, pronounce righteous, set free from. So that's, what, that's why it's possible for a handful of English words to mean basically the same thing in certain contexts. Words like justice, righteousness, fairness, equity, 
and impartiality. Very similar in how we can use those. But those words also have different ranges of meaning in English. For example, for us, justice and righteousness are, all, are, are not always interchangeable. Uh, an example of this is that a, a, a person acting righteously also acts justly, but the reverse isn't always true. Like a, a judge could act justly for, for evil motives. So he would be just and unrighteous at the same time. So the point is, uh, if you're righteous, you're also just. If you're just, you're not necessarily righteous. I'm not trying to confuse you. I'm just trying to show you this is complicated. And it's important to carefully de de define our terms because the world is using these words in different ways than the Bible uses them. And the world is de redefining justice and fairness and equity to refer to equal outcomes. If you haven't noticed this, you'll see it now. You've heard this. Listen for this. Uh, they think that God is unfair if equal outcomes exist. But we need to distinguish between equal outcomes on the one hand and justice or fairness or equity or impartiality. Here's why. God is just. God is fair. God is equitable. God is impartial. But that doesn't mean everyone experiences equal outcomes. Because God has the freedom to show undeserved kindness to whomever he wants. Let me prove this with a, a parable from Matthew 20. Remember the parable of the laborers in the vineyard? So the, the master gives each laborer what he deserves, and he gives some laborers more than they deserve. So everyone gets a denarius, but though some worked all day for it, and some just worked a little while. To get justice is to get what you deserve. Everyone gets justice from God. It's not unfair, though, for God to give extra to some, even when they're less deserving than others. As long as God gives each person what he deserves, God's not unfair when he sovereignly chooses to be undeservedly kind to some people and not others. And none of us deserves God's kindness, right? So God's always fair. All his ways are justice. So I think now we're ready to define the word justice, after looking at all those passages. Here's my pocket definition. Justice is, on the one hand, getting what you deserve, and on the other, giving others what they deserve. Getting what you deserve and giving others what they deserve. What someone deserves may be a reward or it may be a punishment. God always gives others what they deserve because God is righteous. God is just. That's what it means to say God is just. And that's what I mean by the term divine justice. God perfectly gives others what they deserve. So that's our first step of five. Uh, God is just. We are not. God's just character is, is the foundational starting point for defining justice. And now we're ready to connect the justice or righteousness of God with imputed justice. Number two, imputed justice justice. I'll start with this. In the book of Romans, which is the, I just taught on this for the last part of the week at Indianapolis Theological Seminary. This is our topic is Romans. There's this phrase that occurs over and over and over, the righteousness of God or the justice of God. What does that refer to? And there are three basic options though. Interpreters combine these in every way possible. One option is it refers to what God is. God's attribute of being righteous or just. So it's the opposite of the righteousness of God in 117 is the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, Romans 1, 18. So God is righteous, we're unrighteous. That's what God is, he's righteous. Option two is what God gives, God's gift of a righteous status to sinful people. And you can see this in Romans 3, 21 to 26 and many other passages. And this metaphor comes from the law court where righteousness is judicial. It's not about people living in a more righteous way. So righteousness is not about transforming your character. So this gift is God's legally declaring people to be righteous before him. It doesn't morally make you righteous by gradually infusing righteousness into you. That's, that's the second option. The third is it's what God does. It's his activity of saving sinful people. So God writes what is wrong. My opinion 
is, and I can't prove it now, we don't have enough time, my opinion is that it's too narrow to say that the phrase, the righteousness of God, refers to only one of these three options and not the other two. In my view, God's attribute of being righteous, that the first one, is the fundamental concept. And in the context of the book of Romans, that entails both God's gift of a righteous status and his activity of saving. Of those three options, number two, God's gift of a righteous status is most prominent in the book of Romans. The righteousness of God refers primarily to God's positive attribute of being righteous. And when sinful people experience that aspect of God, it can go one of two ways. God saves them by righteously giving them a righteous status, or God condemns them. Here's how John Stott puts it. I love it. It's so memorable. He says, the righteousness of God is God's just justification of the unjust. His righteous way of pronouncing the unrighteous righteous, in which he both demonstrates his righteousness and gives righteousness to us. He's done it through Christ, the righteous one who died for the unrighteous, and he does it by faith when we put our trust in him and cry to him for mercy. The gospel reveals God's righteous way of righteousing the unrighteous. Beautiful. That's beautiful. I know he made up a word, but, but he's doing that because in English, we, we switch between righteous and just, and we miss that the Greek text underlying it, it's all the same word group. So, the righteousness of God refers not only to what God is when he justifies you, but also to what he, he is or what he gives you when he justifies you. As Romans 3, 26 says, God is both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. God righteously righteouses the unrighteous. As Peter says in 1 Peter 3, 18, Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous, the just, for the unjust, for the, for the unrighteous that he might bring us to God. So that's, that's our second of five headings. And justification is distinct from, yet inseparably connected to, progressive sanctification. That's number three, imparted justice. Progressive sanctification. Now, one reason that we are Protestants and not Roman Catholics is that we define justification very differently. We don't say that justification means that God makes us righteous. No, the whole Protestant Reformation over that, that very concept. Justification does not mean God makes us righteous. It means he declares us righteous. It's a judicial standing, not making us righteous. So for Roman Catholics, if you had an equation, faith plus works, and the arrow means results in or leads to justification. For Protestants, faith results in or leads to justification plus works. But even some Protestants, especially advocates of what's called higher life theology, separate chronologically justification from progressive sanctification or, or transformation. So I agree with John MacArthur and many other Reformed teachers that the whole point of Romans 6 is that God not only frees us from sin's penalty— justification, but he frees us from sin's tyranny as well, progressive sanctification. So here's a chart that shows how progressive sanctification is distinct yet inseparable from justification. First, the quality. In justification, you're instantly declared righteous. In progressive sanctification, you're gradually made righteous. Very different. For justification, it's objective, judicial, non-experiential, it's a legal forensic position, as opposed to a subjective or experiential daily experience. Justification is external, outside the believer, as opposed to internal, inside the believer. Justification is Christ's righteousness imputed, received judicially, versus Christ's righteousness imparted and worked out experientially. Justification instantly removes sin's guilt and penalty whereas progressive sanctification gradually removes sin's pollution and power. Justification does not change your character. Progressive sanctification gradually transforms your character. That's how they differ in quality. And then in quantity, for justification, all Christians share the same legal standing. 
You can't be more justified than another Christian. There aren't, there aren't degrees of justification. But for, for, for progressive sanctification, Christians are at different stages of growth, different levels of maturity. And then for duration, justification is a single, instantaneous, completed act, once for all time, never repeated. You can't get justified twice or more times. But progressive sanctification is a continuing process. It's gradual, maturing, lifelong. So faith alone justifies, but the faith that justifies is never alone. God's grace, through the power of His Spirit, ensures that the same faith that justifies a Christian also progressively sanctifies a Christian. They're connected. They're distinct, but they're inseparably connected. Imputed righteousness, justification, necessarily results in imparted righteousness, progressive sanctification. So it's not surprising then that the people to whom God has imputed justice and to whom God is imparting justice are people who care deeply about public justice. So that leads to our fourth heading, public justice, impartiality in society. This is the one that is most controversial in our culture right now. Actually, they're all controversial in our culture, but this just happens to be one that's at the center of a storm. So let's start by hearing what uh, my fellow church elders say in a statement we wrote called Ethnic Harmony, Affirmations, and Denials under the heading Justice. Just two slides. We affirm that the church must love and do justice, which entails treating all peoples from all ethnicities justly and encouraging its members to pursue justice in society. Justice is making righteous judgments according to the standard of God's righteousness. We recognize that individuals and groups with power have often exploited the vulnerable for their own gain and that sinners can create unjust systems. We should examine suspected examples of systemic injustice on their own merits, seeking to destroy ungodly strongholds and taking every thought captive to Christ. Although worldly systems of thought can make accurate observations, we reject all systems of thought that view relationships primarily through the lens of power. That is, those with more power are inherently oppressors, and those with less power are inherently oppressed. We deny that only those with more power can be guilty of showing ethnic partiality. Any person of any ethnicity can be guilty of showing ethnic partiality. So there's a starting point so you know where I'm coming from. I believe that public justice refers to impartiality in society. Here's what impartiality is. First, it's for you to get treated justly, fairly, and equitably. And second, it's for you to treat everyone else that way. That's impartiality. In other words, justice is getting what you deserve, and it's not taking from others what they deserve. Listen to Deuteronomy 27, 19. Cursed be anyone who perverts the justice due the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. So another term for public justice could be societal justice, but I'm purposely not using that term of social justice because our, our culture typically defines that term, social justice, in a way that is incompatible with the Bible. So I'm just calling it public justice. So an impartiality that pleases God goes hand in hand with compassion. Compassion is sympathetic pity and concern for those who are suffering. The author of Hebrews, Hebrews 10, 34 writes, you had compassion on those in prison. He's commending them for that. The Bible teaches that we should treat people impartially, which includes working for fair systems and structures, and that we should look out for the weak and vulnerable. So God's people under the Mosaic Covenant were responsible to uphold justice, public justice, in their government, which was a theocracy. The Old Testament emphasizes public justice as both justly punishing wrongdoers and justly defending the wrong. Here's an example. Psalm 72 says, may the king judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people, give deliverance to the children of the needy, and crush the oppressor. So this illustrates the transcultural principle that public justice includes punishing unjust oppressors. And that should go hand in hand with compassionately caring for those who are unjustly 
oppressed. The prophet Amos is the most famous example of an Old Testament prophet who rebukes Israelites for the sin of public injustice. He writes, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And later, you've turned justice into poison and the fruit of righteousness into wormwood. An example of that, Amos rebukes some Israelites for exorbitantly taxing poor people and thus trampling them. It's in Amos 5 and 8. The prophet Micah rebukes some Israelites for metaphorically cannibalizing fellow Israelites. It's Micah 3. And this leads to his famous rhetorical question, Micah 6, 8. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? So what tends to happen in these debates is someone who has the the definitional framework of the, the world's view of social justice, and then they quote a passage like this as support for a terrible view. So we got to ask, as you read a passage like this, what does Micah mean by do justice? Does do justice mean that we should do whatever political policies the social progressives are advocating? Is that what do justice means? I don't think so. So I agree with a, a book by Kevin DeYoung and Greg Gilbert that answers this question. Their book is called, What's the Mission of the Church? Making Sense of Justice, Shalom, and the Great Commission. So here's, what they, here's how they answer the question, what does Micah mean by do justice? Micah means we should not steal, bribe, or cheat. Conversely, we should, when we're in the position to do so, render fair and impartial judgments. And at all times, in whatever calling, we should do good, not evil. Doing justice is not the same as redistribution, nor does it encompass everything a godly Israelite would do in obedience to Yahweh. Injustice refers to those who oppress, cheat, or make judicial decisions with partiality. Doing justice, then, implies fairness, decency, and honesty. Just as importantly, we see that the righteous person does more than simply refrain from evil. He positively seeks to help the weak, give to the needy, and as he is able, address situations of rank injustice. That's good. So the Old Testament prophets do not rebuke only Israelites for injustice. They also rebuke the nations for cruelty, such as Amos 1.13 rebukes them for ripping open pregnant women. That's, that's from Amos 1.13. Public Justice matters in all cultures, not just for the Israelites under the Mosaic law. Many people in our culture today think that so-called reproductive justice is a human right, a justice issue. But God's righteousness, God's righteousness is what makes human rights right. What humans call rights are right only if God says they are right. So so so-called reproductive justice is actually a flagrant injustice. Again, doing justice, another way to define this, is making righteous judgments. It's doing what's right according to the standard of God's will and character as he's revealed it in his word. Justice according to the Bible contrasts with justice according to our secular age in which justice equals rights. So our secular culture is trying to offer the fruit of justice without the root, the fruit of rights without any standard of righteousness for measuring which rights are actually right. As such, people in our culture learn to enshrine whatever they want with the language of rights. And justice effectively becomes, I deserve what I want. With There's one caveat sometimes, the caveat that others' rights should not be transgressed either. So, three examples. If a woman wants to kill the unborn baby in her womb, it's her right because justice demands it. Or if a man wants to marry a man, it's his right because justice demands it. Or, if a man wants to become a woman through surgery and hormones, it's his right because justice demands it. And sometimes this 
justice as rights view yields just outcomes by the biblical standard, such as the right to religious freedom. But sometimes it yields very unjust outcomes by the biblical standard. And those are not instances of justice, but injustice. So if you ask a typical social progressive, what are some examples of injustice? They've got their list. I'm going to try that. What are some examples of public injustice that Christians should be concerned about today? And I'm going to paraphrase from a, an article in World Opinions in March 2022 by Thaddeus Williams. He's a professor at Biola. He wisely presents four issues that our pursuit of justice should include, even if it's unpopular in our culture. One is abortion. Our pursuit of justice should include these tiny humans exterminated because of larger humans when these larger humans consider that these tiny humans are inconvenient or genetically inferior or too female. That's a public justice issue. That's a structural injustice. That's systemic injustice. Or here's a second example, pornography and its connection to child porn and human trafficking and rape and domestic violence and impaired brain function and broken relationships and depression. Our pursuit of public justice should include the victims of the exploitative pornography industry. Third example, the persecution of believers around the world. Christians are being targeted, imprisoned, beaten, raped, hanged, crucified, bombed for claiming that Jesus the Messiah is Lord. Our pursuit of justice should include the millions of Christians around the globe who are imprisoned or executed. And a fourth example is socialism. So I'm quoting here from Thaddeus Williams. The quest to achieve economic equality between rich and poor through communist and socialist policies has resulted in more than 100 million casualties in the 20th century alone. Our pursuit of justice should include the desperately oppressed victims of far-left economic systems. But you weren't expecting those four examples of public injustice. But I think that illustrates that we're so wired to think of public justice issues in a worldly way. I think that is thinking of it in a more biblical way. So we who are justified people care about public justice. But it's important to distinguish the obligation of individual Christians to do public justice from what God has commissioned churches to do as churches. They're not identical. So here's how my church's elders put it in our ethnic harmony affirmations and denials under the heading, the mission of the church. Two slides. We affirm that the mission of the church is the great commission. Make disciples of all nations by baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and by teaching them to observe everything that Jesus commands us. God has commissioned local churches acting corporately to teach everything Jesus commanded and to equip saints for their various ministries. While Christians care about alleviating present earthly suffering, we care especially about alleviating eternal suffering by verbally proclaiming Jesus as Savior and Lord and calling all people to repent and believe. We deny that doing justice is equivalent to the gospel. Good works are the fruit of regeneration and conversion. We also deny that the church's corporate mission is identical to the mission God has given individual believers. God has not commissioned local churches acting corporately to advocate across the whole range of issues that comprise the work of government. So that, that phrase I read, we care about all suffering, especially eternal suffering, that's from John Piper. He's the source of that phrase. That's a helpful way to say it. We care about all suffering, especially eternal suffering. So we don't dismiss or minimize public justice. We care about public justice. At the same time, we recognize that God's ultimate justice is far weightier than public injustices. So that leads us to number five, ultimate justice, final judgment. Ultimate justice. Isaiah prophesies this about the Messiah. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end 
on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness, mishpat and tzedakah, from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. We're living right now in this already, not yet period. The Messiah's kingdom is already here, but not yet fully here. We're still awaiting the Messiah's government that will uphold perfect, perfect justice, perfect righteousness. So in this life, we protest against public injustice because we deeply desire that justice be served. And that day is coming. Final judgment refers to the day of the Lord when God will decisively judge and defeat his enemies and deliver and vindicate his people. God will perfectly and completely administer justice for all. That's coming. God's expressing his wrath with eternal punishment is justice. It's retributive justice. Romans 9 says that God has endured with much patience vessels of wrath, vessels of wrath prepared for destruction because he desires to show his wrath and to make known his power. So God displays his wrath against sin. And as he does so, he's glorifying his justice. Eternally punishing unrepentant sinners in hell shows that God is just. And when God fully and finally serves justice, what will we be doing? We will be praising Him for it. Seven times in the final book of the Bible, people praise God for righteously judging His enemies, for punishing His enemies. When God serves justice by judging and punishing His enemies, He deserves glory for His wrath and power. So, we have briefly considered five aspects of justice in the Bible. Number one, divine justice, God's character. He is just. Two is imputed justice, justification. God declares us to be righteous. Three is imparted justice. It's our progressive sanctification, our becoming more and more just. Fourth is public justice, impartiality in society. And finally, ultimate justice at the final judgment. So now, this plane landing is going to go fast. I'm going to attempt to tie all five threads about justice together in a single sentence. I'll read it twice, and then I'll conclude with a prayer. Here's the sentence. The just God justly justifies unjust people and progressively makes us just, which entails that we support public justice as we await God's ultimate justice. One more time. The just God justly justifies unjust people and progressively makes us just, which entails that we support public justice as we await God's ultimate justice. Let's pray. We praise you, God, that you are just and that all your ways are justice. Thank you for justly justifying unjust people like us. Thank you for progressively making us just. And we ask that you would give us your heart for public justice, for impartiality in our society. Help us think rightly about public justice. And we eagerly await your coming ultimate justice, for which you deserve glory for your wrath and power. Amen.